The election of 1816 was one of the most harmonious in American history. Party politics had seemingly vanished as the country elected another founding father to the White House. Number five, James Monroe, Democratic Republican, 1817 to 1825, 58 years old, from Virginia. Monroe's a relic. He's the last of the revolutionary generation to hold high office. He's the last of the Virginia dynasty. In person, he cut the figure of the quintessential hero of the revolution, from his boots, breeches, and ceremonial sword, right up to his cockade hat. The funny thing about James Monroe is that no one ever seems to have thought terribly well of him, except his character. Everybody said he was honest, and everybody said he was trustworthy. But uh, no one ever said he was extremely intelligent. Yet this man must have been doing something right because he gets elected twice to the presidency by crushing margins. Monroe's presidency was so seemingly amicable that he was unopposed when he ran for his second term. He had, in many ways, a falsely easy presidency. This is supposed to be the era of good feelings. He seems to reign over a period of peace and happiness in America. But not really. Because if you look just underneath the surface, you have Monroe presiding, but he's presiding over lots of stuff that's going on behind the doors. Monroe's management style reflected his personality. He was a hands-off executive who hired great people for his cabinet, then delegated authority. This served him well during the moments that defined his presidency. At the beginning of Monroe's first term, the territory of Missouri petitioned for statehood. In theory, adding a star to the flag should have been cause for national celebration. Instead, it ignited a great political debate over slavery. Would Missouri be a free or slave state? As Congress debated the explosive issue, Monroe, a slave owner himself, made it clear that he would veto any legislation that restricted self-determination for any state. Eventually, Congress passed the Missouri Compromise of 1820. Missouri enters the Union as a slave state. Maine enters the Union as a free state. And prohibitions are put upon the expansion of slavery. It is a temporary, a temporary solution. Monroe also came up with his own plan. He proposed to return slaves to Africa. Called the American Colonization Society, this led to the founding of Monrovia, Liberia, the only foreign capital to be named for a U.S. president. Unfortunately, this did little to solve the crisis at home. While the slavery question simmered, Monroe faced a border crisis in Florida. The territory was still owned by Spain, but the Spanish did little to govern it. It's a nest of pirates and outlaws, and there are Indian tribes who live there who are certainly not under the control of the Spanish government. By 1818, border incursions were common. Seminole Indians, in particular, were raiding white settlements in Georgia. These raids were often encouraged by British privateers who operated on the Florida coast. In response, Monroe sent troops to the region, led by the hero of New Orleans, General Andrew Jackson. Andrew Jackson ends up being sick and tired of it, and he invades Florida and captures the British and hangs them. So he creates an international incident involving three countries, the United States, Spain, and Britain. Jackson's raid caused an uproar in Monroe's cabinet. Some, including Secretary of War John C. Calhoun, wanted to reprimand the general. And Secretary of State John Quincy Adams sticks up for him. He says that what the British were doing was outrageous, and the Spaniards ought to have stopped them, and they didn't. And Jackson did a preemptive strike, and um, that's what he ought to have done. Monroe did not reprimand Jackson. 
Instead, he opened negotiations with Spain for the rights to the territory. In 1819, the Spanish ceded Florida to the United States without a fight. Border disputes were constant during Monroe's tenure. Significantly, it was a border issue that led to Monroe's defining moment in office. In December 1823, the president delivered a message to Congress and to the world. Ostensibly, he addressed a minor dispute between Russia and the United States over Alaska. But the speech contained a short paragraph that became his legacy. It stated, the American continents are henceforth not to be considered as subjects for future colonization by any European powers. The Monroe Doctrine is our statement that we reject European countries coming in and trying to acquire further territorial gains in this hemisphere. You stay in your hemisphere, we'll stay in ours. It wasn't until 1852 that people began calling it the Monroe Doctrine. By then, it was regarded as Monroe's greatest moment. And yet, he was not the true author. That's a wonderful example of how the presidency is becoming the central branch of the government. And the president is becoming so important. The Monroe Doctrine is written by John Quincy Adams, Secretary of State. But because it happens in Monroe's administration, it's known as the Monroe Doctrine. The end of James Monroe's presidency was a turning point in American political history. He was the last of the revolutionary generation, the last of the architects of the American Republic. These men were not politicians. Their vision of themselves was as caretakers of and leaders of a nation as good citizens, as statesmen. And I think that that maybe marks the difference between the generation of Jefferson and Adams and the generation of Andrew Jackson and the men who come after.